what to think about Hungary. It is a black sheep or is it a European success story? It is true that in the last two and a half years, we have done almost everything in a different way than all the others. We have taken a different road to reach the common targets, such as budget deficit under 3%, decreasing state debt, increasing employment and starting growth. The relative position of the major players in the world economy and in world politics is changing rapidly. The weight of Europe has been declining in terms of production and trade. It is a real danger that between the emerging East and the revitalizing United States, Europe will fetch up in a no man's land. We have to find a way to unify Europe's developed technology, infrastructure, innovative industry, and sophisticated financial system with those practically unlimited natural resources or natural resources which are to be found east of us, mainly in Russia. For Central Europe, this is going to be a serious point on the agenda because we require security guarantees under these new circumstances, not only regarding defense, rather than energy, traffic routes, and free trade as well. The crisis of the European Union and the crisis of the Eurozone is basically crisis of competitiveness. It is often quoted that Europe's share of the world's population is 8%, while we <coughs> account for 25% of the world's production, but 50% of social expenditures. <coughs> this list of numbers raised a serious dilemma itself, but here comes the yet darker other side of the coin. The total debt, state debt, of the EU 27 reaches 11 billion euros. The yearly payment of this sum with interest are more than 2 billion euros. And the member states of the EU produce approximately 1.2 thousand million euros of new debt every day. Deepening the European Monetary Union must not result in less flexible economic policies and must not cause an ideological and doctrine-based way of thinking. The economies of the Eurozone countries are in strong interdependence with each other. Therefore, it is justified to conduct a deep and strict coordination of economic policies in the Eurozone. In the meantime, it is of course unimaginable that, for example, Sweden, Hungary and Bulgaria would need the same type of economic policies. Hungary has become a European success story. In case of fair treatment, after eight years, we should be abrogated from the excessive deficit procedure. Economic growth will start in this year and will be accelerating continuously in 2014 and 15. Our record high trade balance surplus will be sustained. Employment will continue to rise. State debt will continuously be reduced. And the budget deficit will continue to be kept under 3%. Thank you very, very much indeed, Mr. Prime Minister. Uh, on average, for the countries of Central and Eastern Europe in 2013, the uh, financing need will be 10% of GDP. Uh, Hungary is an outlier there, as 19. by far the 19. largest number, almost 20%. 19, yeah. uh, that is clearly a vulnerability. In 2002, when I concluded the four-year terms, the indebtedness of the country was 53% uh, of the GDP, 53 and uh, during our four-year four terms, we decreased it from 60 to 53. When I came back, or when we came back in 2010, the indebtedness was 85. Uh, um, the budget deficit discipline, as just you have said, you know, experience is clear. First time when we were in government, in our four-year terms, every year we decreased the budget deficit. And when now we came back in 2010, we decreased every year the budget deficit. Experience, especially personal achievement experiences, are far more important and stronger evidences and arguments than any kind of you know, theoretical approach in my mind. So we are able to do so because we have done both four times and then three times again. So seven years in that sense consecutively, three years and four years previously, to decrease budget deficit and to decrease state indebtedness, that's part of our political record. So that's the reason why we have some self-confidence. One area where I think Hungary still is seen as an outlier, though, is in central bank independence. Um, can you address your views on that now? In an absolute value. Independence of national bank is, you know, untouchable. 
that's that's the official statement I would like to do here. But we have, <laughs> but at the same time we have to raise the question: Why countries belonging to the same Western world developed a var variety, a colorful solution? How to manage the relationship between the government and the national banks? Because we are doing it in a different way. All advanced economies are in an episode of crisis. And I can read that in the balance sheets of all central banks in Japan, in the US, in the UK, and in the ECB balance sheet. And through different forms, all these balance sheets have considerably uh, uh, increased by something which uh, might be of the order of magnitude of 12, 13, 14, 15% of GDP, which is enormous. In my opinion, uh, the central banks are doing that because they have to substitute to a private sector which is not functioning correctly, neither in Tokyo, nor in New York, uh, nor in Europe. And that doesn't mean that they are dependent. They should not be dependent. And I would say even more when you are in a situation mm -hmm. which is that grave that you have to do non-standard measure and a mark on non-standard measure, the confidence that is anchored by the independence of the central bank is even more important than ever. And so, I'll come on speech. Uh, don't you feel tempted, given what you said about the more, di more uh, diversity, the need for more diversity, to also to ask for some kind of uh, repatriation of some powers toward the member states from the European Union? This issue belongs to them. And if the British would like to, to view the world as the Prime Minister described, it's their job. Nobody can challenge it anyway. So the only point, as I understand, the proposal he had made, he said that we have to open to discussion about the modification of the treaty. <coughs> That's something which is common. So I would like to comment only exclusively that point. And I think it's very dangerous. As I understand the future of Europe, I think that the real growth potential, sorry to say that, that the real growth potential is in Central <coughs> Europe, not in the western part of the hemisphere. So in the forthcoming four, five, probably 10 years, the far more successful part of the European continent will be Central Europe and not the western part of it. If you are successful, if you are growing, if you are producing the growth potential, why should we avoid by any kind of political maneuver? The Eurozone needs us. The Eurozone cannot survive without Central Europe. Look at the German economy. Look at the German economy. If the German economy would like to continue to be successful, they need Central European countries. How they could be competitive. The same quality of performance in a factory of Germany and in the Hungarian factory producing the same car or whatever production, uh, one-fifth in Hungary. Central Europe provides advantage for competitiveness.